Jesus is the true and better Adam, who passed the test in the garden and whose obedience is imputed to us. Jesus is the true and better Abraham, who answered the call of God to leave the comfortable and familiar and go out into the void, not knowing whither he went, to create a new people of God. Jesus is the true and better Isaac, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us all. God said to Abraham, Now I know you love me, because you did not withhold your son, your only son whom you love, from me. Now we can say to God, Now we know that you love us, because you did not withhold your son, your only son whom you love. Jesus is the true and better Jacob, who wrestled with God and took the blow of justice we deserved, so that we, like Jacob, receive only the wounds of grace to wake us up and discipline us. Jesus is the true and better Joseph, who at the right hand of the king forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his new power to save them. Jesus is the true and better Moses, who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. Jesus is the true and better Esther, who didn't just risk losing an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate heavenly one who didn't just risk his life, but gave his life to save his people. Jesus is the true and better David, whose victory becomes his people's victory, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. Jesus is the true and better Job, the truly innocent sufferer, who then intercedes for and saves his friends. Jesus is the true and better Jonah, who was cast out into the storm so we could be brought in. The Bible's really not about these famous characters. The Bible's really not about you. The Bible is about Jesus. Welcome here. I'm Chris. Uh, Great to be here with you. I hope you guys are having a great summer so far. Um, That was our, uh, our little sermon video for the series that we've been doing about the Bible is all about Jesus and We've been going through these different characters in the Old Testament, some famous characters, and looking at how these characters ultimately point us uh, to Jesus in some way. And so last week we were looking at Joseph, and so this week we are on to, does anyone know? Who's after Joseph? Moses, that's right. We had a kid say it in the last service. It's family service today, so we had a kid answer before everybody else, which shows you our kids are awesome. Um, so I want to invite you, actually, we're going to be in a New Testament passage today as we look at the story of Moses. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 1. So if you would turn there, um, and then I invite you to stand with me uh, for the reading of God's Word. Hebrews 3, Hebrews 3, uh, verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. You can have a seat. It's God's word. So uh, it is a family service today. So kids, if you are listening, we have an assignment for you. Um, if you guys would like to grab uh, one of the coloring pages, there's some coloring pages, I think, out in the hallway if you didn't grab one. Or you can just grab a plain sheet of paper and draw me a picture today of the story of Moses, okay? So maybe multiple pictures if you want. You could do comic book style, whatever you want. But draw pictures of Moses as we go through his story, okay? so good? And then I'll have a candy, a candy for you after, all right? The most important part. Uh, why are we doing this series? Uh, some of you might be wondering, um, 
why emphasize this? Why, why talk about how um, the Bible is all about Jesus? And what is that, why does that matter? Um, maybe for some of us, it feels a bit elementary to even say it, a bit Sunday schoolish, you know? Uh, I think I've told maybe some of you this story before that uh, when I got involved in ministry a number of years ago, I was volunteering and I was teaching a Sunday school class of three and four year olds. And, uh, you know, I, I was new to the whole thing. And so I just, I threw out there a question to them. I said, kids, who's the bad guy in the Bible? And they all yelled, Jesus! <laughs> and the reason they do that is because the answer is always Jesus, right? And the little three and four-year-olds already know this about, about Jesus and about the Bible. And so for some of us, it might be like, you grown up in church, you, you've, you've known this for a long time, you think like, yeah, the Bible's about Jesus, duh. Like, newsflash, this is, this is not news for me. Why would this uh, be important? Why spend a whole summer uh, looking at this? I think one reason is uh, we are prone to forget. Uh, often when we're reading our, our Bibles by ourselves, we tend to just kind of focus on ourselves. We tend to interpret it and apply it just to ourselves and maybe not look at why it points us to Jesus in some way first. Um, in the book of Hebrews, if you know Hebrews at all, is a very, very important New Testament book. Um, in many ways, this book actually captures our series. There's a whole book of the Bible that really captures this point, that Jesus is better. That's the point of the book of Hebrews. Jesus is better. And the author just goes on and he talks about angels. Jesus is better than angels. Moses, that's what we're trying to talk about today. He's better than Moses. He's a, he's a better sacrifice. He's a better priest. He's a better covenant mediator. He's all these things. He's better. That's the point of this book. And yet, also what's interesting about the book of Hebrews is it contains a chapter near the end, chapter 11. We affectionately call it the Hall of Faith. And that chapter actually could almost seem to point us in a different direction. It's, it's a long chapter of all these Old Testament heroes. And it's sort of like, hey, look at these heroes and, and imitate their faith. That's kind of the sense we get as we read through those characters. And so we might be tempted to think, well, okay, well, yeah, that's what I should do. That's what I, I want to look at these Old Testament characters, see them as heroes, and imitate their faith. What's interesting, though, is at the end of that section of the Hall of Faith, the author then points us back to Jesus and says, hey, picture those heroes from the Old Testament. Picture them as, as fans in the stands watching you run your race. They're cheering you on, but like you're focused on one person, Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Uh, you can hear the Olympic music right now, right? We're all running a race. In other words, we're, our life is a, is a race. It's a, it's a marathon, and we are running this race, and we are to focus on one person, on Jesus, and obviously see these characters as a pointers to him. It's important to uh, read the Bible this way, because if we don't, we miss the ultimate point. And it can lead to a lot of really strange interpretations of Scripture, strange even applications of the text, a misuse of the Bible. And there's no shortage of that today. I mean, just go on Instagram. You'll see. There's lots of examples. It matters um, that we see the connections, the Old Testament and New Testament connections, because it helps us see Jesus in a newer and deeper way. And it builds our confidence that what we are reading and, and what we've put our hope in is truly solid ground. This is real stuff. So speaking of connections, the book of Hebrews has many of them, many, many connections. Uh, it spends a great deal of time uh, quoting from the Old Testament and kind of interacting between the Old and New Testaments. If you're newer to the Bible, um, you may may not realize that the Bible is kind of divided into these two big sections called the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you think of it like a play, okay, if you go to see a play, there's always like the first act, and then there's an intermission where you go get coffee, right, and treats and things like that, and then you have the second act, and it's the same way uh, with the Bible. 66 books, they're organized into these two sections. Testament is another word for covenant, 
And covenant is another word for a two-way promise. So it's, it's two parties making a promise to one another. So we have an old promise and we have a new promise. Testament is the word that's used because it's an inscribed promise. And that's why we use that word testament. The book of Hebrews then is a New Testament book and it refers back to the Old Testament. It quotes from it more than any other book in the New Testament. It's a very important book for not just uh, Christians, but for the Jewish Christians in the early church. Uh, the Old Testament itself, if we, if we think of the 39 books of the Old Testament, um, it's further divided into some other sections. So in our Bibles, we have five sections. The, uh, the first five books are the books of law, the books of Moses, and then we have uh, books of history, and then wisdom literature, and then major and minor prophets. In the original Hebrew Bible, it was only divided into three main sections, and they're all kind of mixed up. You have the law, the first five books, same thing, and then the prophets, and then the writings. It's the same books. They're all just organized a bit differently. Uh, the section of books that is most foundational to the whole Bible and to the Old Testament are the first five, what we call the Torah, the law, the, the law of Moses, or the Pentateuch, sometimes we call it. These books were written by Moses as he was carried along by the Spirit to write Israel's early history. There's actually numerous places within the Torah itself where it tells us Moses wrote Moses, therefore, is a foundational figure for the Jewish people and for Jewish Christians. The only other Old Testament characters that even come close to Moses would be Abraham and David. And the reason is that they all were given a, a covenant with God. They all were given a special promise from God. It's all part of the Old Covenant, each one of those. They were all given a different part of that covenant. So, Moses, though, I would argue, is a more foundational figure than even David, even King David, even Father Abraham. Even though Abraham's story comes before Moses, it is Moses who records Abraham's story. Moses takes up four of the five books of the Torah, while Abraham is only featured in the first book and only part of it. Moses, uh, after he dies, all of Israel's subsequent leaders are compared to him. Joshua, uh, the judges, King David himself, uh, they are compared to Moses. They are evaluated on how good they did based on how much they emulated Moses. He is the towering figure of the Old Testament. It's kind of like how people um, compare NBA players, right? You might think LeBron James, pretty awesome. Maybe he's the GOAT. Maybe he's the, the greatest of all time. But who do we always compare him to? Michael Jordan, that's right. This is great. You guys are all hockey fans here, right? So this is like, you don't even know what I'm talking about. It's okay, the Lord will forgive you until you find a great holy sport like basketball. But we always compare LeBron James to Michael Jordan. He's, he's the figure. He's the one that everyone knows is the greatest of all time. And it's the same thing here. It's Moses. He's the towering figure. David even wrote in his Psalms, he, 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 um, he wrote the book of Psalms, there's 150 Psalms, they're all divided into five books, and that's to emulate the five books of Moses. So he is the great leader, the great founder, the great deliverer of them out of Egypt. He's their great hero. I want you just to imagine like someone who's that in your life, who's, who's your greatest hero, a leader, a foundational person in your life. Maybe it's your mom or dad. Maybe it's someone else you, you admire greatly, you, you imitate them, you fashion your life after them, you look to them for guidance or inspiration. That's who Moses is for the Jewish people and for Jewish Christians. And yet, the writer of Hebrews says in our text this morning, Jesus is greater. He's more glorious. How exactly? Well, let's dive into his story here. We're going to look at the true and better rescuer, the true and better mediator, true and better hero. First, the true and better rescuer. Um, Hebrew says that we should consider Jesus, our apostle and high priest of our confession. Uh, this word apostle, it's, um, it's a word that means a sent one. So someone who's sent out, particularly with a message, a good news message. So I want to think about how Jesus is a, as an apostle. 
He's a sent one. He was sent. God sent him into the world with good news. And also in context, we can also first think of Moses because there's been this comparison here to Moses and Jesus. And Moses also was a sent one. He was sent to be a rescuer and a deliverer of God's people in Egypt. Uh, Many of you may know his story. Some of you might not. So we're going to review a little bit here. Uh, Famously, his story begins in the land of Egypt, right? Joseph, the last guy we looked at last week, um, he was a a great ruler. He was the second in command in Egypt. But Joseph died, and, and the Israelites continued to grow. And then a new pharaoh took power and didn't remember Joseph. And began to see these Israelites growing and and expanding and became worried and threatened by this kind of immigration of these people into his land. He began to grow fearful. And so he decided to do a couple of things. First, he enslaved the people. And then secondly, he ordered, um, when that didn't fully work and they, they continued to grow, he ordered the Hebrew midwives to kill all the Hebrew boys secretly after they were born. But the midwives feared God, and they didn't listen. So Pharaoh ordered a more aggressive policy to have the Hebrew boys thrown into the Nile River. But a Hebrew father and mother, after giving birth to their son, they they wanted to protect him, and so they made a basket for him out of bulrushes and pitch, and they placed him in the reeds of the Nile River, and they had Miriam, the, their, their older daughter, and, and this child's older sister watch over the child. And then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to the river to bathe and discovered this child. And she opened the basket and took pity on this child, it says. She said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. And she named him Moses because she drew him out of the water. Moses means drawer. And and God would use that name of his to actually, it was symbolic of what he would go on to do, to draw God's people out of the waters, uh, out of Egypt through the waters. In an ironic twist, God took the very children, one of the very children who was supposed to be a victim by being thrown in the Nile, used that child out of the Nile to eventually come and be the deliverer and rescuer of God's people. It's an amazing thing. As Moses Grew up in the Egyptian court. He was still raised by his uh, mother, uh, and he was connected to his people, even though he was raised uh, as a prince of Egypt. And he saw how they were oppressed. And one day, he he saw an Egyptian beating a man, and Moses uh, was so angry, he took justice into his own hands, and he killed the Egyptian. And then he fled into the desert when it was found out that, that people knew about this crime that he had committed. And so he fled. He went into the desert. He went into the land of Midian. And while he was there, uh, he, he ran across uh, some women who were being harassed by some shepherds, and he rescued them out of their hands. So we see Moses is this figure who cares about justice. He cares about rescuing people out of things by the waters, no doubt. Moses found a new home with Jethro, the priest of Midian, and then he married his daughter, Zipporah, and became a shepherd himself. After many years had passed, 40 years of living in this desert, having a whole life there, he's about 80 years old, and we read this famous encounter he has with Yahweh, the God of Israel. Uh, This is Exodus chapter 3. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He fled... He led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why this bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses. He said, here I am. He said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. 
I know their sufferings. I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God's going to send Moses to be their deliverer, their rescuer. He's the first apostle, in a sense. He's the sent one. He is sent out with a message of hope, a message of freedom. He tells uh, the king of Egypt, let my people go free and worship me at this mountain where God had met him. And as Pharaoh hardened his heart to this message, so Yahweh, the God of Israel, revealed his power, sending great signs and wonders and devastation on the land. And as Pharaoh continued to harden his heart, God gave him a further punishment of hardening his heart for him. In total, 10 plagues fell upon Egypt, plagues of frogs and flies, gnats, boils, and darkness. Just as Pharaoh had killed the firstborn sons of Israel, so the final plague brought the death of the firstborn sons of Egypt. All of this could have been prevented if Pharaoh had just turned from his sin. Finally, the Pharaoh let the people go free. And they plundered the Egyptians and they ran off into the desert and they headed toward Mount Sinai and they rested at the Red Sea. Pharaoh again hardened his heart and he sent his armies to go get them back. He regretted his decision and to kill them at the Red Sea. And the, the great miracle of salvation takes place at this moment. This is, this is the great salvation event of the Old Testament is when God parted the waters of the Red Sea and the people passed through the waters onto dry land on the other side. This event is spoken of again and again throughout the rest of the story of the Old Testament. When the Egyptians tried to do the same, the waters rushed back and they were drowned in the sea. Moses was solidified as their great hero, their great rescuer, their great leader. So, with all of that dramatic salvation, it is not a small thing that the writer of Hebrews says that as great as Moses was, Jesus is better still. He's a better rescuer. He's the great apostle, the sent one, who, who brought a message of good news, of, of gospel. People expected that Jesus would come to rescue them from their oppressors, the Romans, who were in power at that time. So just as Moses came to rescue from Pharaoh, Jesus will come, he's the Messiah, they believe that, and he'll rescue us from the Romans. But Jesus had his sights set on a far greater enemy. The devil himself, sin itself, which plagues all of humanity down to their very core. Moses was sent in power and authority to rescue the Israelites from the power of Pharaoh, but Jesus was sent in weakness to die as a lamb slaughtered. So he could rescue all of humanity, Jew and Gentile, open up a door for Jew and Gentile to come to him. And what's interesting about Moses' story is that almost as soon as they were rescued from Egypt, uh, they get out into the desert and the grumbling begins. Uh, we took our young adults uh, la last week to the fireworks, and uh, we started driving around Kitsilano, and we're looking for parking, and uh, it's terrible to try to find parking on a fireworks night in Vancouver. It was worse than I thought. Okay, I thought, oh, I think it'll be up here, it'll be a good spot. No, we're just driving all over the place. We're getting a little stressed. Some of the other young adults are texting me. They're like, Chris, I'm going to kill you. I'm like, and it didn't take very long for the grumbling to begin right? The ingratitude. All of that started to happen. And then I realized, like, what am I grumbling about? Like, we're in Vancouver on a beautiful night, and we're here to watch the fireworks. But that's how quickly it happens. That's how quickly it happened. We, 
We just do this thing, and this is exactly what the Israelites do. They just get out of the, they've just been through this great salvation, and they, they begin to harden their hearts. They become stubborn. And then we realize, oh, it's not just Pharaoh who has a stubborn heart. That belongs to everybody. It was a great salvation, but it didn't go far enough. Moses didn't have the power to change them from the inside. This is why Hebrews, right after our passage this morning in, in chapter 3, if we go over to verse 7, it says, like, what's the point of, of comparing Jesus and Moses? He says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. As great a salvation as that exodus was, we need a greater rescuer. We need a true and better Moses who can accomplish this for us, who can change us from the inside down to our very heart, our very soul. What's the message of Christianity is basically we are great sinners, but we have a greater Savior. He's, his love is greater than our sins. We are in need of rescuing, and yet God sent him, our apostle, our rescuer. He died on the cross. He took our guilt. He took our shame. He took our sin. He opened a way for us to be forgiven, to be healed, to be transformed from the inside out. So soften your heart. Turn from sin. Turn and trust. That's the message. Ask him to forgive you, cleanse you, and walk with you through life. All right, secondly, he's our true and our better mediator. Um, If you've been watching uh, the Olympics, you'll know uh, there's been this phrase being tossed around called, it's the summer of summer, okay, for us in Canada, because there's this uh, 17-year-old phenom, Summer McIntosh, and she is just uh, cleaning house and swimming right now. She's, She's won three gold medals and a silver medal already uh, at the Olympic Games right now, and... um, it's fun, right, to watch your people representing your country, right, to, to go and compete in the games, and you're sitting there watching them, and, and they represent us. They represent Canada to the world, on the world stage. And so as we cheer for them, it's like, yeah, Canada, right, even though we're sitting at home watching, eating potato chips, and feel, <laughs> feeling like slobs, uh, we feel proud, right, that we did it, like we did it even though it was was Summer who who won the gold, right? Because she represents us. She represents Canada. And if you can kind of understand that whole thing, you can understand how priests worked in the Old Testament. Uh, Priests function in much the same way. They they represented. Uh, They actually represented uh, and functioned in a two-way role. They, they, They would be God to the people and the people to God. They would pray and intercede and offer animal sacrifices to God on behalf of the people. And then they would turn and they would teach God's law, God's rules, his Torah, his story uh, to the people. They represent God to the people and the people to God. Their primary role then is to mediate. Uh, A mediator, to mediate is to stand in the middle, to stand in the gap. Um, It's actually where we get the word media from. Uh, media stands in the middle of, it actually connects people, right? We, we use media to connect two parties. A mediator brings connection and reconciliation between two parties, even. Hebrews 3, verse 1 says, Consider Jesus the high priest of our confession. Jesus is called a high priest in this context. And again, we can compare this to Moses because The writer of Hebrews goes on to talk about the role that Moses played as a mediator of Israel's old covenant in chapter 8. Moses is never directly called a priest, but in many ways he was greater than the priesthood, that he installed the priesthood. God used him to install his brother Aaron as the first priest. And Moses really was a greater mediator in a lot of ways than the priests were in the Old Testament because he had this access to God that no one else really had. And he stood in the gap for God's people. He interceded for them. 
Uh, actually, when they, when they left Egypt and they, they got through the grumbling stage, eventually what happened was uh, an army came out, the Amalekites, and started attacking them. So Moses goes up on this mountain and he's praying and he's interceding for the people and he's got his staff raised and his arms raised. And as he lowers his, his arms, though, the, the battle starts to go the other way. So when he raises his arms, the battle goes the Israelites' way. So eventually Aaron and and Joshua come and they like just hold up his arms, right? As he intercedes for the people and they win. They win the battle. And then we get the first moment where Moses records that story. That's the first uh, mention we have in Exodus 17 of him recording Israel's story of this happening. This interceding, this mediating uh, continues. They arrive at Mount Sinai. Uh, Moses is invited to go up and only him can go up to the pinnacle to be with God in close proximity, face to face. He would perform ritual animal sacrifices. He brought the Ten Commandments back down the mountain to the people, and he wrote the rest of the Torah. He interceded in prayer when they sinned. He accepted offerings from the people. He built a dwelling place for God called the tabernacle that God instructed him to do. Moses stood in the gap in all these ways. And then he held a ceremony for the Israelites at Mount Sinai. And this is sort of like when Israel and God get married. Uh, Exodus 24, verse 1. He said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall come near, shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came. And told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. How do you think that turned out? (laughs) Not very good. But man, they get an A for having a good spirit about it, right? Good attitude about it. This was the Mosaic Covenant. It was good. The laws that God gave, they were good. They showed the people what God was like. They showed them right from wrong. They revealed that he's a holy God, a good God. And yet as great as Moses was to mediate this covenant, the writer of Hebrews says Jesus is better still. In Hebrews 8, uh, he says this in verse 4 to 6. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve, the the old priesthood, serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. Moses' covenant was good. The covenant he mediated was good. Jesus' covenant that he mediates is better. What's the difference? Moses represented the old covenant. He represented, more specifically, the law, justice, rules, It's not bad. It's good. We need it. Uh, But there's a problem. The law, even though it is good, it is not enough. Law alone cannot transform. It cannot change people. Law alone can only bring death and condemnation because we violate it. Law is like an x-ray. It it can show you where a problem is, but it cannot fix you. God's law is good. It calls us to love others, to not kill, to, to not steal, to not be bitter, to not be jealous, to not defraud each other. But the problem is, just like the, the Israelites showed here, we will do it, we won't. <laughs> we break it. We know what's right and from wrong, and we, we still violate it. We can't adhere to these laws perfectly, and so law cannot save us. 
So Jesus comes along. He is the true high priest, the true mediator between God and men, the true and the better. He was killed on a cross to bridge the gap between God and people. And because of his death, justice for sin, the breaking of the law, is paid in full. And we receive grace. Hebrews uh, 2, just before our passage, says this, Therefore he had, he, Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every respect. This is talking about how he became human. So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, sacrifice. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus is merciful. He's faithful. He can sympathize with our weaknesses. He didn't just come to bring law. He came to bring grace. He came to give us his spirit to actually transform our hearts. He mediates a better covenant because it touches down to our souls. Uh, Maybe you don't have a Moses poster in your room. Uh, Maybe he's not the guy you look to as your hero. But maybe you're a person who's never really graduated from being a person of law. You care deeply, like Moses, about justice and setting things right. We care deeply about rules and how they're violated. We want to hold people accountable. We want order, not chaos. We want law. Those are not bad things. It's not bad to want law in your home. It's not bad to want law in society. Those are good. But the real question is, is it enough? Is it, is it is going far enough? Have we really understood the gospel of God's grace? Some of us come to church our whole life. We adhere to the law. We mostly do the things God's asked us to do. We don't steal. We don't do some of these rules, we think. Problem is, we we, we become our own judges of our own actions. We look over at others, we see them break the law, and we say, can you believe that guy's a Christian? He broke the law. How can he call himself a Christian when he does X? See, when we've been shaped and molded by law alone, we are the most likely to be judgmental of others while we give ourselves a pass. We're gracious to ourselves and we're super judgmental of others. If we parent our kids by law alone, we may instill good behavior and manage to keep pretty good, you know, order of the house. But law alone will not transform their hearts. They may adhere to the rules. They may come to church and do all the things. But do they really know who God is? Do they really love him? Have their hearts been changed? Our kids need Jesus. They need a relationship with him. Law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Jesus and his spirit and his grace. And only that can transform us and make us into a new creation. Now, that's a really important implication of this. But another one is this. If you are a Christian here and you have been changed by God's grace, um, we have the privilege of, of being God's representatives to the world around us. We are now in Christ. Christ is in us. And so 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10 says this, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession." that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're not priests the way Jesus was a priest. We don't offer sacrifice for sin once for all. And yet, we are commissioned. We are now in Christ. We are commissioned to be priests to the world, to represent Christ to the world. You and I get to bring God to the world. We get to bring God people's needs to God in prayer. Amazingly, unlike the Olympics, where only the best of the best are chosen to represent their country 
in God's kingdom, we all get to be priests. It's not just a select few, like in the Catholic system, okay? If you're Catholic here today, I'm not trying to diss you fully, okay? But we believe here that all Christians are priests, priests to our world around us. We, the people who can't get our act together, we get to be called priests. Pretty cool. And yet daunting sometimes, because we fail. And it's amazing that God would entrust his gospel to us. But we have the privilege to love people the way he's loved us, to care for them the way he's cared for us, to pray for them the way he's done so for us. Are we doing that? Thirdly, our true and our better hero If we go back to our passage in Hebrews 3, uh, verse 5 and 6, it says, Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. We are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Uh, The writer of Hebrews says Moses was a servant in God's house. House here kind of has a double meaning. He's referring to the tabernacle, but he's also referring to God's household, his people. We must remember the audience the author is writing to, they see Moses as their great hero. He is their great hero of faith. And yet as great as he is, at the end of the day, the writer calls him a servant. He's a servant in the house. But Jesus is a son over the house. He has authority over the whole thing, over the whole people. Moses is the house, he even says, switches analogies. And then he says, Jesus is the builder, though, of that house. He gave the blueprints to Moses. So he's the, it's a subtle nod to be like, Jesus is divine, right? He's the creator. That's what he's saying. Verse four tells us, None of this is a surprise to Moses. He testified to the things that would be spoken later. He knew. He knew he wasn't the one. So when did that happen? Well, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the book of Deuteronomy is is this um, kind of second giving of the law. So Moses is standing uh, at the the shores of, of the Jordan River, and they're about to head into the promised land. And He looks to the people and he gives these sermons and they're recorded in the book of Deuteronomy. And he repeats a lot of the laws, but he explains them and expounds on them a little bit more. In chapter 18, Moses says this, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb, or Mount Sinai, on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God to see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command. Moses knew He was not the great hero of Israel. Someone's coming. Someone better is coming. And Moses is just pointing people to him. The future Messianic prophet, priest, king, rescuer, mediator, hero, author, finisher, Jesus. After saying all this, I mean, what should be our response? Well, the writer of Hebrews goes on, and he makes this big point in the rest of the next chapter. And we can sum it up in one word. Rest. Enter his rest. Relax. Because Jesus has done it. Relax into Jesus. That's one of my favorite... uh, Uh, ways to explain what faith in Jesus looks like. Relax into Jesus. He has won the war. He has done it all. We can trust him and rest in him. And I know that's hard. We don't always do it perfectly. We struggle with that. But may we learn to rest in him and to walk with him through life. And then as we go through all the responsibilities that we have 
that we do it in the rest of Jesus because he is with us. He is our high priest. He is interceding for us. He is our rescuer. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful. Um, We're so thankful. Our hearts, um, God, for those of us whose hearts are not merry right now, I pray uh, that you would uh, make our hearts happy. Would you help us to understand what this news means for us? Would you help us to rest in you? Would you help us, Lord, to just take comfort in the fact that you will win all the great battles? As dark as this world can feel at times, Lord, as overwhelming as it can feel, Jesus, we take comfort in you. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, our great rescuer, our great deliverer, our great mediator. We thank you, God, for this great truth and this good news that we get to share with others. Help us to do it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.